Good afternoon, everybody. I'm about the only person that will address you today that isn't honourable. <laughs> we all have one thing in this room in common. We care enough about this country to give up a Sunday to muse about its future yeah. in a building where I have established there is no wine. <laughs> When David Seymour called and asked me to speak here, I thought, what an inspired choice. <laughs> and what a risky move. I am no political party's friend. So I, bo I broke with my retired man tradition, and I said yes. After all, I am always only a heartbeat away from delivering a State of the Nation address. <laughs> I warn you, my brush strokes are broad. I should also tell you, this is not going to be Paul Henry's stand-up. Why? I think this country is deeply in the shit. <laughs> and I think the options to leverage ourselves out of the shit are becoming increasingly limited. Largely because the people willing and capable of doing it are few. And most importantly, because so many good people just cringe inside and say nothing as matches are lit to incinerate more of New Zealand, which we used to stand for, which used to be important, when people globally used to look at this country in envy. Yeah. I believe ACT could be the last cab on the rank heading in the right direction. Yeah. yeah. So, let's sort this shit out. Like you, I care a great deal about this country, in spite of the fact I consider it broken and in desperate need of repair. It's possible it is beyond repair, I'm going to be honest, from where I stand, in which case I will quite happily relocate permanently offshore. Still, we need to give it a shot, yes? Some background. A week or so before the last election, I decided the political situation was so urgently in need of addressing my informed views required extensive exposure. And so, I wrote to the Herald. <laughs> and because I gave them my views for free, they published my voting conundrum. So I'm gonna tell you how I felt now. This is what I wrote a week before the last election. I had not yet decided which party would get my precious vote, but I had decided my constituency vote was going to David Seymour. And I absolutely knew the direction in which the country had to move. So I knew the parties who were not in contention to win my tick of approval. I couldn't give Labour one more day at the helm. There was no question our country, brimming with opportunity, which it still is, was going backwards at pace. As Labour tinkered with social engineering in a country full of mutes, too afraid to say enough already, the economy, and with it bastions of vibrant living, were sliding. We were all feeling it. Was New Zealand, I asked in the Herald, a safer country to live in than the one they inherited control over? No, it was not. It was measurably a less safe place to live and do business. Were health outcomes, education and housing, standout winners under Labour? No, they were not. Was our infrastructure in better shape? <laughs> I mean, you don't even have to. And most importantly, if you were born with disadvantage in our country, were you assured of basic protection from abuse at the hands of those charged with your care? No, you were not. Promises were not kept. Transparency was far from transparent. If Labour were given another term in office, my prediction at the time was the very best we could expect was no personal benefit from the axing of GST on fresh fruit and vegetables. And only a massive added cost in compliance to administer it. That, I predicted, was the very best. Labour had squandered the opportunity the pandemic had afforded our country and them. They'd been given a green light from me and from all of you 
to borrow tens of billions of dollars to support New Zealand through the pandemic. But did they capitalise on our newfound COVID free haven? Did they build infrastructure that would pay dividends long into the future with that money? I was encouraging them on air to do just that. Like others, I told them exactly how they could do it, but no. Not only were we saddled with astonishing debt, but in the aftermath of COVID, we managed incredibly to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Everyone globally wanted to be part of New Zealand's COVID success. And then everyone forgot our name and moved on, except us. I'm an environmentalist at heart, but I could never vote Green. They're not a party championing the environment. They are socialists who have no bloody idea how to make money. Like Labour, they know only how to spend other people's money. And to be fair, they'd be very good at it given half a chance. <laughs> they could not be a trusted tail wagging any dog to party Māori are separatists, end of story. We have a small country geographically isolated. With that comes challenges, but also phenomenal opportunities. We can meet those together and thrive as one people. Separately, we will and we are atrophying. It's not about how big our slice of the pie is, how many times do you have to say this? It's about how we can grow the pie together so everyone's slice gets bigger. Yeah. It, Are you on my payroll? <laughs> it's alarming how often I find myself, you're not, say, you're not gonna say here, here in a minute. <laughs> it is alarming how often I find myself agreeing with New Zealand first. And I feel like I should apologize for saying those words. <laughs> it has to be said, you would have to agree with me, Winston Peters was something of an anchor on Jacinda Ardern's unpleasant extremities. <laughs> but I wrote in the Herald, I don't know how unpleasant her extremities are. <laughs> but I wrote in the Herald, could I trust him? Could I trust them? No, I couldn't. So, national and act. It is all about the economy, I wrote. If you have the money, you can invest it. If you haven't, nothing can save you. And we haven't. National should have been my obvious choice at the last election. It was my political home for decades. So why was it not? Why has it not been now for several elections? I'll tell you why. Because they tread too lightly. Yeah. Yeah. Paralysed... Yeah. Paralysed by the fear they might alienate one or two voters if they were entirely pragmatic on policy direction. You cannot be everything to everyone, so don't try. Now, you can't only offer criticism, so in the Herald, I said this. What do we need? This country, I said, needs a lurch towards strong growth and a massive lurch towards encouraging the private sector. We need a stupendous lurch toward greater security for our people. The first priority of any government is to protect its citizens. And we need to draw a thick line under the separate governance bullshit that's been encouraged to infiltrate our systems and lives. Thank <laughs> this is how it is for me at family functions. <laughs> Thank God we have moved just a little, just a little in that direction. We need to fix the roads and put our people to work on projects that lift us all in real ways. We need to welcome New Zealanders that we need, not flog our bloody capacity silly, bringing in those that need us. I didn't think... I didn't think National would have the fortitude to turn our ailing ship in the right direction. Certainly not on their own. At best, I thought, they would slow our advance towards disaster. And so act. Act, I mused in the Herald. Could they have the spine national needed? Probably not, I wrote, but they might help. <laughs> I wrote that David Seymour would never be Prime Minister. I don't think he will, but he gave it a nudge a few days ago. <laughs> he had to that point the great fortune to be able to proclaim 
without fear of having to deliver. But at least he did at times proclaim. National, I wrote, needs act to keep it on some kind of trajectory that just might advance us as a country beyond a few more years. At the last election, I was not optimistic for our plucky little country that batted far beyond its weight. You see, I don't think we are now outward thinkers who understand our opportunities and can advance together. I think we've become a rather sad little country who would prefer to squabble amongst ourselves than face the world with a united pride and ambition. So the point of writing my views before the last election was a desire to inspire a little bit more consideration, I thought, after talking to people around me. Perhaps I thought a few souls reading would sense a little more urgency in their vote, just perhaps. There's no time to waste. I ended the piece. The inevitable is far too close. So anyway, that was my thinking before the last election. Both of my votes went to ACT. Since then, there is no question our country has been nudged in the right direction. You've heard it here tonight, buying us a little more time. But as I predicted, National are treading too lightly, constantly looking over their shoulders at the last opinion poll. Yeah. ACT is providing something of a spine, but you are suffering from the tyranny of your own success. As part of the government, your proclamations have to be kept in check. It's a shame, but that's how Parliament works. To party Māori have upped their separatist rhetoric. I mean, we all knew that was going to happen. The Greens are still barking. <laughs> and Labour are waiting in the wings for the tide to turn, as we all know it will, so they can borrow more money to re-employ public servants. Death by a thousand cuts. Here's the thing. You are only change makers if you actually make change. The words alone will not save us. David Seymour is right to predict, as he has, the need for a significant reset because a revolutionary change is on the way. It's not knocking on our door, it's already in our hallway. It can't and shouldn't be stopped, and I'm going to come back to it in just a second. One of the things I love about ACT is a sense of fearlessness, and you must not lose it. Change makers speak their mind and air their opinions at every opportunity. You must do that. When did New Zealanders lose their ability to challenge, cowering rather than commenting, to silently approve rather than vocally condemn? Silence is the enemy of truth. And I love the way ACT are not afraid to recall our wondrous pioneering past, like so many are. In only a handful of decades, we have transitioned from a people of nation builders into a population of whiners and hand ringers. My mum and dad were pioneers and so was I. Dad built the Walkworth Satellite Station, the Harbour Bridge, the Marsden Point Oil Refinery, <laughs> on his bloody own. <laughs> he ran the Iron Sand Project. He blew shit up. No cones in sight, no cones needed. Because pioneers don't need cones. While my parents were together, I was surrounded with enough inspiration to last a lifetime, and it wasn't just me. Do you remember? As a population, we looked forward with excitement. Now we just mither around with a sense of dissatisfaction. We need to change attitudes now. I remember as a little boy from Howick the wonder of Friday night shopping in Queen Street with my mum. In spite of tens of millions of our dollars spent over decades, the future has delivered us a sad, dangerous wasteland, unfit for young children. And we can't fix it, because it is not politically correct to hoover the streets of the antisocial. <laughs> Just uttering those words will give people conniptions. My daughter, Bella, 
is having twins right at the moment. I mean, literally, I've got my phone with me. <laughs> I went out with her last night and she can't walk anymore. She's lost it. Her whole body's moved into childbirthing. <laughs> and I wonder what her twins will be like. I wonder what their New Zealand will be like when they grow up. What are the chances they will be pioneers, building an exciting future in a slice of paradise, the envy of the world? Because that's what New Zealand once was, and not that long ago. For that to happen, we need to reshape our economy now, so we can afford to meet the opportunities that are racing our way. ACT has always been bold on education. Here's a tip. Be bolder. I applaud you for charter schools. We need to try new things. Be bolder. New Zealand's school achievement is plummeting like our school attendance. In some ethnic groups, achievement is outrageously poor. How was it ever allowed to get to this? Tertiary institutions in this country have embarrassingly low global ratings, and they are falling. A few weeks ago, the country was up in arms at the news over a quarter of new primary teachers couldn't pass NCEA Level 1 maths. Half didn't pass Level 1 science. This will surprise you. You know what? I don't think that matters in the slightest. Every child has at least one device that can answer any question they might have. Our challenge is to inspire them to have questions to be broad of vision and passionate about learning. I want teachers who will infuse children with the wonder of just finding out. If I were a teacher at the end of every day, I would say, gather around. The classes will be this big one day. I <laughs> They're probably almost that big now. I would say, gather around. When you guys get home, I would say, hopefully someone will ask you what you've learned today. What will you say? And then I would go through all of them. What will you say? What have you learned today? And if they couldn't all answer that, I would send them home with a cool fact. Wombats are the only animals that poo cubes so they don't roll away. In the entire world, no other animal's poo is in a cube. Now, obviously, I wouldn't tell them that every day, you understand. <laughs> It would be a different fact every day. <laughs> if you imagine it, like why don't wombats want their poo to roll away? It's an entire lesson in questioning and inspiration. It's not preparing them to do well in an exam. It's sitting on the mat and opening their eyes to wonderment. How many children do you say, see who are full of wonderment? Teach children to navigate devices so that algorithms don't narrow their view of the world for the rest of their life. There are an increasing number of disaffected people in this country. Many of them will be there when these children get home from school. I want teachers in classrooms that can overcome the indifference children are so often surrounded by. I want primary schools in New Zealand to be full of children who are bursting with questions and excited to explore answers. Okay, without any doubt, our biggest challenge right now is building a resilient economy. Without the money, we can do nothing. We need money to be internationally competitive with salaries for teachers, doctors, nurses, police. My eldest daughter, Lucy, is an oncology nurse in Australia. She's paid the equivalent of a week's New Zealand specialist nurse's salary for just over two days' work. And she has the opportunity to offer drugs and treatments not available here. How do you encourage her to come home? I wouldn't even try. 52,500 citizens left last year. You can bet most of them were people we need, not the people we want to leave. They don't go. They never go. <laughs> They've got family and friends overseas. <laughs> They've invited them to come here. In the last decade, our population increased by almost one million people. That's almost a 25% increase in 10 years. And yet, we still don't have enough doctors, nurses, police, engineers, and so it goes on. If we did, we couldn't afford to pay them anyway. Now, that is a conundrum. That is something change makers need to sort out right bloody now. 
But it comes back to the economy and ours is in tatters for decades. There's been talk in New Zealand about the need to attract productive investment from offshore. But we've never been truly bold in our attempts to do it. My frustration during the pandemic that Labour locked doors on opportunities knows no bounds. It is time to be bold, to create policy that makes relocating your offshore enterprise here a no-brainer. It costs nothing to cherry-pick some of the most desirable players globally and offer very generous incentives. Then other people's money can build our capacity. If Margaret Thatcher can do it in Telford, believe you me, it can be done bloody anywhere. <laughs> Changemakers are bold. We don't need a safe pair of hands running New Zealand at the moment. Business as usual is not an option for us because business as usual is a bloody disaster in this country. It's landed us right where we are. If we want to thrive into the future and improve the standard of living for all New Zealanders, we need fundamental change, not tinkering. We need to be known globally as a country where people can expect to be rewarded and applauded for their efforts. Foreign investment rules in New Zealand are some of the most restrictive in the OECD. They should be among the least restricted. What the bloody hell are we trying to protect here? <laughs> I'm only talking for between 23 and 26 minutes. That started when I started, so we're getting very close to the end. <laughs> I mentioned revolutionary change a moment ago. There are two examples of final warnings we are failing to heed. News Hub and Smith & Coe's closures. <laughs> that Smith & Coe is shutting its doors is not the surprise. The surprise is they didn't do it years ago. And I'm not jumping the gun when I say this. I think we all know the consultation period is time and money-wasting faff. On top of the fact they're located in a wasteland under an avalanche of traffic cones, all the at once magnificent retailer had become was a living museum. Society had moved on. If today is as good as your operating environment is ever going to be and you can't adapt, you must shut up shop. Just like News Hub, the model has changed. Not necessarily a bad thing. In my last book, published almost five years ago, I wrote that just before Discovery purchased MediaWorks TV assets, I had a meeting with TV3 executives. I presented my plan to save the hemorrhaging network. Item one, shutting down News Hub. They couldn't afford to run it. Had they done it then, there would have been money to invest in current affairs programs. The environment, I said, will never be as, it, as good as it is today, and today you are going broke. My bet is the budget replacement 6pm news stuff are cobbling together will be costing them far more than they anticipated. And if you listen very carefully now, you'll hear the penny dropping. <laughs> as stuff management realise it. They're probably ruining that decision. A decision that just goes to prove we are still not listening to the warnings. Just like the child at school with the answer to every question in their hands, so all of us have the latest news at our fingertips every moment of every day. We don't need to congregate around a TV at 6pm to find out who's dead or what the weather's going to be like tomorrow. <laughs> journalists, journalists, said about the closure, no, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> God help us. Every year, they reported tens of millions of dollars in losses. The plethora of other platforms, the atrophying audience numbers, didn't see that coming. We were told the closure was an affront to democracy. That statement was an affront to intelligence. <laughs> The Greens and Te Party Māori will be surprised to learn neither of those two organisations are run as charities. They're private enterprise. And if they don't make a profit, even the most lethargic among them will eventually shut up shop. This, though, 
is not the revolutionary change. It's the forerunner. There was the wheel, the spinning jenny, the combustion engine, the silicon chip, the internet. But our true revolutionary change will be AI coupled with robotics. One of the things that's plagued New Zealand for decades is our embarrassingly low productivity. That's one of the enormously exciting things AI will address. But I fear New Zealand is in no shape to capitalise on the momental change that's barrelling towards us. The Bank of New Zealand has predicted by the end of this year, unemployment could reach 5.5%. Here's what I predict. I predict soon we'll be looking at wonder at unemployment rates that low. Are we vulnerable? Yes. Is our economy ready and resilient? No. The IMF currently predicts AI will affect around 40% of jobs, many of them lost. If they're right, and here's the thing, the IMF are the most conservative here. If they're right, that's approximately 20% added to our unemployment. If you do the math, you may need a device here, particularly for a primary school teacher. <laughs> That's 25.5% unemployment when you add our estimated unemployment level. Goldman Sachs predicts 300 million jobs will be lost or degraded by artificial intelligence. And that is just in the United States and Europe. At the extreme, there are those that believe ultimately AI and AI robotics will replace upwards of 90% of jobs. And we can't afford to be standoffish the rest of the world will not and never has waited for us. On the contrary, we have to be able to invest in this technology. AI will bolster productivity, but at a huge cost to some. Increasing inequality will be one negative factor. Already globally, truck and cab drivers, cashiers, retail salespeople, those who work in manufacturing plants and factories have been have been and will continue to lose their jobs, to be replaced by robotics and AI. It is happening now. Driverless vehicles, kiosks and fast food restaurants. Quick phone scans at stores will soon eliminate most minimum wage and low-skilled jobs. Artificial intelligence systems are ubiquitous. AI-powered digital voice assistants share everything you want to know. You just have to ask them the questions. Instead of a live person addressing a problem, you can engage with an online chatbot. And you know what? You're doing it now without knowing. AI can help diagnose cancer and health issues, turbocharging research projects. Banks currently use sophisticated AI software to check for fraud and non-compliance. AI predominantly controls driverless vehicles, all of our news feeds, social media, job applications. I predict it will rapidly take over the legal sector. It's here now. I mentioned my daughter Lucy, the oncology nurse in Australia. When I told her I was going to speak here today, she said, and she didn't know what I was going to speak about, are you going to get AI to write your speech? It was the first thing she said. And I said to her, no, it can't be me. And she said, wouldn't want to be. <laughs> she said, it can be a better you. <laughs> Amongst the other things it does at her hospital, is deliver bad news to patients. She said it had much more empathy than the surgeons. So here are the questions that we have to have governments asking right now. What will generations of unemployed do? What will give their lives meaning when they know there is no chance of ever having a paying job? How much will we pay them to live? And how will we afford a standard basic income for everyone who needs it? That could be, eventually, almost everyone. How will we stop vast numbers of people becoming even more disaffected? How will we do that? How will we stop people becoming even more disruptive? We're going to need a strong economy to withstand the challenges of the short and medium term. If you've just lost your job at Smith & Coe's, you're walking out of a magnificent relic and entering the perfect storm because it is here now. And I can probably see many of you thinking, oh, I don't need to worry about AI, I won't be here much longer. <laughs> I'm not looking at anyone in particular. 
<laughs> Actually, the funny thing is I was looking at some people in particular. <laughs> Here's the good news. Our economy might be in shitter's ditch, but our country is still brimming with potential. More of us need to wake up to the challenges we face and speak loudly of the need to work together to advance our opportunities as a nation, not as disparate groups. So as change makers, here's what you can do. Dylan Thomas put it beautifully, don't go quietly into that dark night, rage against the dying of the light. Speak loudly of our need to reshape our economy for all of our good. Separatists will not be on the right side of history. They are nothing more than energy wasters and we don't have the time or energy to waste. Don't only talk to those that agree with you. Talk with those that don't. I mean, you're going to do no good in this room at all. Talk with those that don't. Promote the need to attract investment from offshore in all its forms. We need people we need. We have plenty of people we don't need already. <laughs> and continue to reshape education. Our success depends on what we do now and the attitudes of our young. Let's fill our schools with budding pioneers, enthusiastic for their own futures. Now, before I step off the stage, I want to ask each and every one of you a question. When you get home and someone asks you, what did you learn today? <laughs> what will you say? Okay, I'm going to help you out. The reason wombats <laughs> poo cubes is because, just like all of us, certainly all of us that live in Remuera, we are fearfully protective of our boundaries. <laughs> and wombats live on shale banks quite often with a bit of a slope. And the last thing we would want, and I'm thinking about us at the moment, would be any of our boundary pegs slipping into our neighbour's property. <laughs> I wish you all the very best. Thank you for coming to a place which is dry.